Hi, my name's Scott the Miniature Maniac, and today we're gonna paint a, well, I have no idea what this thing is, but it's spooky, that's for sure. Sponsored by Wicked Foundations. What up, mini family? People struggle with coming up with paint schemes. It's honestly probably the biggest issue that most people have when painting. What color should I use? Well, I can't answer that question for everybody today, but what I can do is show you a trick that I often use while coming up with paint schemes on this diurnal beast. So let's give it a shot. The trick is one of color temperatures. This will become more obvious as I paint the figure. The model that was sent to me was 3D printed and primed already, so my first step was laying down a base coat. I wanted this color to be my maximum shadow eventually. Oh, look at that, it has a little butthole. Plus 10 points for anatomical considerations. I felt like this color wasn't dark enough to be a maximum shadow, so I mixed in some black ink to darken it down. Ink is nice in this application because it doesn't affect the dilution of what's in the cup of my airbrush, like thick acrylic paint might. So I can just mix some in and get right back to the airbrushing action. I applied this darker shadow only to the underside of the figure. Next up, I applied my first layers of highlights. This monster has a lot of complicated anatomy as far as his musculature goes. It's really similar to a horse in that way. These types of models are pretty difficult to paint as far as rendering all the volumes on each individual muscle. It's certainly possible, it just takes a long time because there are so many of them. Dang, Diana Beast being jacked! I struggle from a similar problem. <laughs> For this reason, I used my airbrush and applied a mixture of white and yellow ink from above, making sure to preserve my darkest shadows. When you have a lot of organic shapes like this beast's muscles, the airbrush really expedites the process of highlighting and shading. I slowly transitioned into wider and wider highlights with my airbrush, being more and more reserved with where I put them. While I do that, let's talk about today's sponsor, and that's Wicked Foundations. Wicked Foundations has a Kickstarter currently in process called Tales of Terror. Tales of Terror is a 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons supplement with its own unassembled and unpainted miniatures for you to enjoy. Inside the bestiary, you'll find three different twisted tales, each with their own engrossing lore. A twisted tale is a story for players to explore and encounter absolutely wicked monsters. The miniature we're painting, the Diano Beast, is from the Blossom of Pestilence tale, but each tale has wonderfully horrific miniatures. I've come across D&D add-ons before, but one that includes minis and also a different grim setting is really awesome and would be a fun twist on D&D that I would probably enjoy. For 50 bucks, you can buy any individual twisted tale and all of the accompanying miniatures, which normally retails for $60. Or for 145, you can pick up the whole enchilada, which is three tails and all of their minis, a $200 retail value. You can find the Kickstarter and all the information for it linked in the description below. There are big, nasty miniatures, so go give them a look. Thanks for supporting YouTubers, Wicked Foundations. Now back to the video. Before I do too much more work on the body, I want to airbrush the big flower petals. They are conveniently separated by this sinewy, fibrous material, which means that I can apply my base coat for both sections with an airbrush without getting much overspray on either section. I don't trust myself to do the highlights and shadows on both sections, but at least I can save time with the base coat. Notice that I'm using another warm color here, a magenta. Back over to the white skin tone, I loaded up my airbrush with a sepia ink and started to slowly apply it to the lower portions of the legs. Oftentimes, animals lose coloration in their fur on parts of the body where they receive the most wear and tear. My dog, Bullet, has one messed up leg that she uses less than the other three, and that paw has the least amount of white fur in it, or as my wife and I call them, twinkle toes. Maybe this beast doesn't have fur, he's just a little bit dirty. Either way, this works. The last step we'll do with the airbrush is a gloss varnish. I'm doing that so my next step, which is selectively applying a wash, goes on better. The glossier the surface, the better the shade sinks into the deepest part of the mini. I started with a red-brown, like Reikland Flesh shade, a shade from Games Workshop. I didn't like how red this was, however, so I mixed in some Army Painter Strong Tone to get it closer to brown. I applied this wash selectively to the areas where there were a lot of details, but avoided the flatter parts like along the beast's back. 
I then came in with pure white paint and started to reinforce some of the areas of highlight where the wash went a little too crazy. I painted areas like the stretched skin along the spine, the rib cage, and the upper part of the muscles. After this, I still felt like the body needed some more detail. I took some thinned red paint and a sharp brush and made little slashes along the rib cage and the legs. Maybe this beast walks in thorns a lot and gets cut often, maybe it's self abuse, who knows? After that stuff was all set up, I knocked back the glossiness with a satin varnish applied through my airbrush. I then added a little glossy blood dripping from the wounds. It's important that I did this after the satin varnish because I wouldn't want the varnish to affect the finish of the blood. Next up as a final detail to the skin, I glazed some pinkish tones around the stretched skin on the spine to give the impression that the skin was bruising a little bit. Now on to the beast's mane, which is made out of lord knows what. I started with a red base coat, again, another warm color. The color I'm using has a pretty satin finish, which is intentional because my first step is to wash it with a brown color. Instead of having to apply a gloss varnish, I'm just taking advantage of the properties of the paint, saving time. It's worth mentioning that satin finishes and glossy finishes aren't necessary for washing, they just kind of help the process along. Next, we're going to start very tediously highlighting each strand of the sinew with a more saturated red. We're starting pretty muddy and desaturated, and as we increase in highlight, we'll use more and more saturated reds, culminating in a pinkish highlight nearest to the tops of the strands. It's important to note that pink is not a saturated version of red, but it's a lighter version of red. If you're struggling with this vocab, I have a video dedicated to miniature painting vocab, you can check out linked in the top right hand corner of the screen right now. To knock back some of that pink, I'm going to apply a red ink over the pink to bring it back into red territory. By doing this, I'm able to take advantage of the light value of the pink, but still have it read as red because ink applies translucently. This results in a red that's nice and juicy. Now on to the massive flower petals, a major part of this miniature. These petals have a lot of tiny detail on them that you could probably shade and highlight, but I'm going to choose to ignore them and instead create my own detail with a light pastel pink color. I'm going to create a kind of ribbing like you might see on most leaves. I'll also highlight this ribbing with brighter and brighter colors toward the top. These leaves have a really nice round volume, so to up the contrast a bit, I took a purple ink and glazed in some shadows, making sure to end my brush stroke in the area where I want the most intense shadow to be. I really like how this not only amped up the color, but it also gave me much needed contrast. This process was kind of meticulous, but when it was done, it looked really cool. Now onto the skull. I'm going to fill in the eyes with some epoxy skull because I want to make them glow. Our base coat of the skull is going to be an off-white cold tone, and I'll apply highlights by mixing in more and more whites to this color, but this is where my trick is really revealed. The entire model is painted in warm tones, and then on this singular part, I swap out the color temperature. This is a great way to attract attention to a detail that you find important, in this case, the face of the miniature. Additionally, just using the super bright and saturated colors all around the mini's face also helps. You're really sucked into looking at the face. Now on to the eyes for even more attention grabbing detail. I started with an undercoat of white followed up by teal. The white helps to get a nice bright teal and I would do something similar with other colors like hot pink or yellow, etc. Once I had the base coat down, I did two things. One, I outlined the eye socket in a darker blue and two, I built up the highlight toward the center of the eye, making the center look brightest. To get a nice glowy effect, it's a good idea to have a pretty intense contrast, particularly very bright colors. Lastly, I was feeling like if this model was from a storyline called the Blossom of Pestilence, we needed some more ickiness. I took some Mod Podge Dimensional Magic and purple ink and mixed them together and then applied it to the spines of the leaves like it was leaking. That was a pretty fun detail. Lastly, I worked on the base, which started with some base coats. I wanted to experiment with pigment washing this time around. I ground up some pastels into X20A, Tamiya's thinner, which is mostly some form of alcohol. I then applied it to the base. My hope was that it would dry super dusty looking, but instead it almost applied like a second base coat instead of a wash. Maybe my ratio of thinner to pigment was off. I'll have to experiment more in the future. 
I tossed on some tufts, painted this model's partial base rim black, and that was the Dionel Beast all finished up. I don't paint a lot of monsters because honestly, they're daunting. You have these large areas of the model that aren't obvious what they should be. You need to decide how you're going to paint those areas as opposed to something like a Space Marine where all the parts are neatly defined and obvious. Monsters are often more of a canvas than a 3D coloring book. What did you guys think of my color temperature trick? I've done it a few times at other models and I kind of like it. Do you guys have other fun tricks for coming up with schemes? Let me know in the comment section. That's gonna do it for this one, guys. If you like seeing me paint kind of more of a monster type miniature, I painted one from Creature Caster and you can find that video right up there in the top right hand corner of the screen. If you like the mini that I painted in this video, as a reminder, you can get it in a Kickstarter that's also linked in the description below. Tales of Terror by Wicked Foundations. Check it out. If you like the channel and you want to support it, you can do that in a number of ways by buying merch like this hat or supporting me on Patreon. All things, again, can be found linked below in the description. Subscribe or die! And most importantly, don't forget to pay my medals!